All right. Good morning, Church of Cross. Everybody doing well? Man, good looking group this morning. Why don't you turn to that person next to you and say, I think he's talking to you. You guys are good looking this morning. Well, listen, we're continuing our series called, hey, don't get too carried away here, okay? <laughs> Only kidding. And hey, we're going to continue our series called Hashtag That's Not in the Bible. If you're new with us, we are doing a series that we're looking at common sayings and beliefs that so many people believe that are uh, not really not to be found in the Bible. That's really not true. And, um, and if you missed uh, the previous weeks, you can always go to our website and you can uh, catch up and, and watch the uh, messages there. Before we get started, though, I do want to pause and I want us to pray for those that lost loved ones in this horrible uh, terrorist attack in Paris. Let's just bow our heads and pray right now. Father, we just come before you, and God, we can't even begin to imagine uh, what the family and friends are going through who've lost those, uh, their, their loved ones in that horrible attack. God, we pray, Father, that you would be with them. I pray, Father, that this would be a time that they would not run from you, God, but they would run to you. And God, I pray, Lord, that this would be a wake-up call, Father, for for not only the people of Paris and France, but really for the world, God, that, that life is so fragile, God, and that we need to have a right relationship with you. And we just pray, God, that you'd bring good out of this. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, Bible talks about in the last days there would be terrible times. And, and the, actually, the word that that was translated from Greek actually means demonic times. And really what we are seeing that's taken place really across our nation with the shootings on campuses and the stabbings that are going on and what we're seeing through the world, we can't be shaken by that. We need to understand, you know, this is to be expected. And, and um, so we just need to understand we have an enemy of our soul, which is interesting. We're going to be talking about the devil today, so I think the timing is, is pretty uh, timely. And, you know, um, as we talk about the devil, we're going to be looking at myths about the devil and what we want to do is really kind of sort out what is true and what is myth concerning the devil. I want to give you four myths about the devil. First one is this, the devil wears red. Okay. You know, Hollywood and all kinds of cartoon TV cartoons portray him as Satan having horns and in this red suit and, and carrying around a pitchfork. But we need to understand that is based on medieval folklore. And not in the Bible. In fact, the Bible talks about how the devil is a master of disguises and he loves, he prefers to, to really appear as an angel of light. Here's the second myth that the devil is everywhere. And what we need to understand is God is everywhere, God is omnipresent, Satan is limited. Satan has demons throughout the world, but the devil is not watching you and I 24 7. Myth number three, the devil is to blame for all the evil in the world. And, you know, a lot of Christians kind of blame the devil and maybe for some, uh, some sin that they got going on in their life and kind of goes back to that old Flip Wilson line, which I'm showing my age. But if you haven't heard of Flip Wilson, I'm sure you've heard this line, the devil made me do it. Well, James 1.14 begs to differ with that. Here's what the Bible says. It says, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And we can't blame the devil. We have to take personal responsibility for our disobedience and repent before a holy God. Here's myth number four. The devil lives in hell. And maybe you've seen different artwork that portrays the devil kind of like running his diabolical evil organization from the, from the flames of hell. Or I know my wife and I, we were at an art museum this summer, and we saw uh, this one uh, piece of artwork that had images of crowds of souls in the dark, flaming caves. And, you know, you got the devils running around with pitchforks and, you know, uh, torturing the people. And Satan was overseeing the whole, or, uh, the whole deal. The only problem with that is that's not true. Satan is not the ruler of hell. Satan has never been to hell yet. And when he goes there, he will not be there to rule and be the king of hell. It will be a consequence to his action. It will be punishment. Actually, Jesus says hell has been prepared for the devil and his angels. It's a place of punishment for the devil, not a place for him to rule over. Until then, the Bible tells us in Ephesians that he's the prince of the power of air. And, and why? Because he actually runs his show from a remote area of, of, uh, of heaven. And the good news is that's not going to last forever. And the 
Better news is that if we're a believer in Jesus Christ, we do not have to fear the devil. And what I want to do for the next uh, few moments is I want to talk about four things that we do need to know about the devil. Here's the first one is this. He is real. And, you know, some people believe that the devil is just kind of like this old wise tale that's been kind of invented by church folks to try to get people scared into serving God or scared into, you know, having to go to church. Or some people say, you know what, I don't believe in the devil because I've never seen him. I don't know anybody that's met him. But Jesus talked about the reality of the devil. He didn't say that the devil was some old wise tale. He didn't say that the devil was a figment of our imagination of some evil villain that we made up in our mind. Jesus taught us that the devil and his demons are real. As a matter of fact, this is what Jesus said in Luke 8, 12. The seed that fell beside the road is like the people who hear God's teaching, but the devil comes and takes it away from them so they cannot believe it and be saved. Jesus said, man, this, is the, this guy's the real deal. The devil comes and takes away the word from people's hearts. Jesus, in the scripture, had a face-to-face encounter with the devil. And in Matthew 4, 1, it says, Then the Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by, by the devil. What happens in this passage is Jesus just comes off a 40-day fast. And he was hungry, and the devil came to him and said, Man, why don't you turn these stones into bread? That was his first face-to-face. And then the second temptation, is the devil offered to Jesus, man, why don't you climb to the highest temple, and why don't you jump off? And God will command his angels to protect you and to rescue you. And Jesus said, as it is written also, that you should not, shouldn't tempt the Lord your God. The third temptation that Jesus was tempted with, Satan took him over to this high, high peak, this high mountain that overlooked all the kingdoms of the world. He said, hey, listen, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus' response in Matthew 4, 10 and 11, Jesus said to the devil, go away from me, Satan. It is written in scriptures, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So the devil left Jesus and angels came and took care of him. He's real. And and Jesus let us know that the devil is the real deal. Here's number two. He is a liar and a deceiver. The devil, when he's at his best, he's at his best when he's lying and deceiving. And and he's just causing people to fall for his deception. This is what the Bible says in John 8, verse 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to do what he wants. He was a murderer from the beginning and was against the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he shows what he really liked because he is a liar and a father of lies. You know, the devil, when he was in heaven, he, re- he rebelled against God and, and he created the whole thing called lying and deception. God created everything else. The devil created lying and deception. He is the father of lies. And listen, he is the biggest liar that you will ever meet. He's the biggest con artist that you'll ever meet. The greatest lie that the devil gets people to believe is that, uh, gets people to believe that he doesn't exist. I actually did a little internet research and found out that 30 to 40% of people do not believe in the devil. Man, he is such a pro at lying and deception. Another great lie that that, um, he has the the culture embrace and believe is that, hey, if everybody's doing it, it can't be that bad. Actually, Revelation 12, 9 says, the giant dragon was thrown down out of heaven. He is that old snake called the devil or Satan who tricks the whole world. The dragon with his angels was thrown down to the earth. Notice he deceives the whole world. Satan and his his demonic forces are all about deceiving people and the world. And And the devil deceived the entire world by getting him to believe these different lies. Hey, if it's popular, hey, it's gotta be okay, man. I mean, how can so many people be wrong? I mean, hey, listen, my favorite actor, my favorite actresses, uh, you know, they're promoting this. My favorite band is singing about this. My favorite sports athlete has embraced this. And how can, how can so many people be wrong? I mean, look at the TV commercial, look at the TV show, look at the movies that are out. Everybody's doing it. How can it be so wrong when everybody's doing it? And the enemy is so deceptive, 
so smooth that he sucks people in to his deception. And one of the greatest lies is it has to be okay because everybody's doing it. Or he may try to repackage it and, and present it to you and say, well, hey, if it feels right, it must be right. And 1 John 2.16 says this, for everyone, everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And what is John telling us here? That these kind of behavior that you're seeing going on in the world is not from God, but they're from the evil one. They're from the world. And the evil one tries to get us to, to just embrace every desire that comes our way, man. If you got this desire, man, just give yourself to it. If it feels good, hey, it must be right. It's okay. But John has reminded us, he's trying to get us to understand something, that these desires that are so prevalent in our culture, in our world, are not from God. They're from the world. They're from the evil one. And a devil is trying to get us to, to, to really embrace this deception. And he's been doing it for years. We're just going to go back and look at Adam and Eve and just how he used this deception to get them to, to really disobey God. And, uh, and the way he approaches, man, if it feels right, man, it must be right. I want you to see how this de deception really unfolds with Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, 1 and 6 says, Now the serpent, that's the devil, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. In other words, he's smoother than any other animal around. And then it goes on to say, he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? I want you to notice that the devil did not come to Adam and Eve in his red Halloween outfit. He's too sly for that. He didn't come to them with the pitchfork and his cartoon-type character. And, and really, you know what Hollywood and, and these cartoon characters have done is that you know, it really caused us not to take the devil seriously. But he came as this litty, little bitty snake. And can I tell you something? The devil doesn't attack you, again, in this Halloween outfit. The Bible says that the devil is like a serpent. And there are over 2,900 species of snakes in the world. They, they're such a wide variety. They're four inches up to 30 feet long, and they come in all different shades and colors and sizes. There's some poisonous, some not poisonous, some that will swallow you whole, some that will wrap themselves around you and choke you to death. But I don't care if it's a foreign snake or this beautiful snake with all these rainbow colors in it. A snake is a snake. <laughs> and can I tell you, the devil comes in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes he comes as an angel of light. Sometimes he comes loud. Sometimes he comes in a silent fashion. Sometimes he comes very boldly. Sometimes he comes very sneaky. But what we have to remember is whenever he comes, whatever shape he comes in, a snake is a snake. I don't care if the person comes, you know, disguised as a teacher and a professor, if he's trying to make you doubt God. A snake is a snake. She might be the most beautiful woman that you have ever laid eyes on. She has the most outgoing personality. But if she's trying to get between you and your wife, a snake is a snake. <laughs> Young lady, man, you might meet this guy that looks like the knight in shining armor. He's got so many muscles. He's got muscles in his earlobes, okay? He drives a black BMW uh, convertible. But he, if he's getting you, trying to get you to sleep with him, a snake is a snake. Guys, she might be the hottest woman under the sun, and when you walk down the mall, every head is turned towards her. If she tries to get you to compromise your moral standings, a snake is a snake. And you know, you may have friends that are fun to be around, man. You have a great time with them. But if they're trying to get you to pull, if they're trying to pull you in a direction that goes against what God has for you, there's a snake in the midst. And again, I want to remind you that the devil doesn't come in this, you know, cartoon type of Halloween outfit. Genesis goes on to say, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the tree, trees in the garden, but God did, did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Notice that Adam and Eve knew what God had said. 
The devil says, you know what? It's not really as bad as God's making it out to be. You're not going to die. God's blowing this thing out of proportion. I mean, there could be a little fallout from it, man. Don't worry about it. God will get over it, man. Go ahead. Trust me. It's not going to be that bad. And then Genesis uh, verse 4 says, you will, you will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And here's the evil one saying to Adam and Eve, man, God is keeping something from you. I mean, if you eat from it, you know what? Man, you're, mis you're going to enjoy something that God's trying to hold, hold back from you. Listen, God is not for you. He's out against you. God is gunning for you. He's, God's pushing you around. Are you going to take that or are you going to step into it? Go ahead, do it. Have some fun. Verse 6 says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Notice it goes on to say it was pleasing to the eye. The lust of an eye, it, it looks right, it feels right. I want you to say, I want to again point out, it says pleasing to the eye, man, I've got to have more. And the Bible goes on to say that, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, which is the pride of life. Man, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to be wise. And she took some, she ate it, she gave it to her husband, and they bought the lie that the enemy ha had approached them with. That if it feels right, if it looks right, if it tastes right, it must be cool. It must be okay. Let me read to you what Proverbs 14, 12 says. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. The enemy is so good of just trying to, you know, get us to, to buy these lies and deceptions, and we just need to understand he's the master of lying. He's the master of deception, and we've got to be aware of that. That's why it's so important for us to be anchored in the Word of God so that we understand how God thinks and, and, and what's dear to God's heart. Here's number three. He wants to take you out. His end game is to take you and I out of the equation. The Bible teaches us that we are in a spiritual battle, and we're all a part of it. Every single one of us here this morning, we're all a part of it. And the devil is devising. He's always plotting. He's always trying to strategize how to take people out of the equation. The Bible says this in Ephesians. Put on the full armor of God so that you can fight against the devil's evil tricks. He has strategies, he has schemes, he has techniques that he has been practicing for years. He practiced them on King David. He practiced them on Joseph. He's practiced them on Moses. He's got schemes and, and, and plans that he has used for years from the beginning of time to, to try to destroy people. Verse 12 says this, our fight is not against people on earth, but against the rulers and authorities and the powers of this world's darkness, against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly world. Paul wants to remind us that we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We think our battle is against that neighbor that's getting under our skin. Our battles are against our boss at work that, that seems to, uh, to hate us. That maybe our battles against that, that, that bully at school. Paul says, no, man, our greatest battle is against spiritual powers and forces in high places. Folks, there's a spiritual battle that every single one of us is in the middle of. Peter says this, 1 Peter 5.8, control yourself and be careful. The devil, your enemy, goes around like a roaring lion looking for someone to eat. He prowls, he's sneaky, he's cunning, he prowls around like a roaring lion. Why does he prowl around like a roaring lion? The scripture says because he's looking for someone to eat. He's looking for someone to devour, another translation will say. But I want to point out the Bible doesn't say that he is a lion. The Bible says he's like a roaring lion. He makes a lot of noise. That's what the devil does, man. He makes a lot of noise, but he does not have the authority to back it up. And that leads into my final point. He is limited. Hear me today. He is limited. Some people view the devil 
as he is, he's on equal turf with God, that, that God represents good, the devil represents bad, and there's, there's this big, you know, cosmic battle going on between good and evil, and they're wrestling, and they're fighting. We don't quite know who's going to get out on, get, you know, going to defeat the other person. We, we have no clue. There's just this ba big battle going on. First off, I want to tell you, the devil isn't anything like God. He isn't even close to comparing to God. Make sure you get this. God is the creator. The devil is the created. God is infinite. The devil is finite. God is everywhere. At the same time, the devil is limited. God knows everything. Satan doesn't know everything. If Satan knew everything, he would have never got kicked out of heaven and is waiting for the lake of fire to be his punishment. So he doesn't know everything. God is all powerful. The devil is not all powerful. He is limited. His power is limited. You may ask, well, well how in the world did, did his power get limited? Here's number one. God defeated the devil at Calvary. He was stripped of his authority. He was stripped of his power by the cross that Jesus died on. Colossians 2.15, God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority with the cross. Talking about Jesus. He won the victory and showed the world that they were powerless. In other words, let me give you Stan's translation. The devil was neutered here, okay? <laughs> Jesus defeated the devil and all of his demonic forces on the cross. He made a spectacle of them. And listen, Satan, your enemy, is a defeated foe. And not only is he defeated, but his future is the lake of fire. And so he is limited. And here's what Re Revelation 20.10 says. And Satan who tricked them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur with a beast and a false prophet. There they will be t punished day and night forever and er ever. That's Satan's ultimate destination. That is his future. And he is limited. Here's number two. You can resist him. You can resist him. Make sure you get this. You do not have to be fearful of the devil. You don't have to be fearful of demonic forces. He is limited in his power. And we can't go around making excuses and maybe even falling for that mindset. You know what? I just can't overcome this. The devil is too powerful in my life. Hear me. If you don't get anything else out of today, get this. The only authority and influence the devil has in your life is the authority and influence that you give him in your life. I want to say that again. The only authority and influence the devil has in your life is the authority that you give him, the influence that you give him. Listen to what James 4, 7 says. So give yourselves completely to God, stand against the devil, and the devil will run from you. The devil will run from you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you do not have to be influenced. You do not have to be in bondage to the devil. The Bible says all you have to do as a follower of God is to completely give yourself to Jesus, to honor God, to purpose to serve him. And when the enemy comes and tries to tempt you and he's coming upon you, the Bible says you resist the devil, and he will run from you. Notice it doesn't say he'll just kind of walk off quietly. No, he will run from you. We make things so complicated. We've made things so complicated in the church over the years. You don't have to light 12 candles representing the 12 tribes of Israel you know, or three candles representing the Trinity, and you don't have to burn incense to represent your prayers going up to God to try to defeat the devil. There was actually a movement years ago in the churches that you needed to know the names of different demons to be able to have authority over them. Can I tell you something? That is foolishness. There is nothing in the Bible that states that you need to be on a first name basis with the demons. I do not want to know their names. I don't I want anything to do with them. You follow what I'm saying? That's foolishness. That's goofy stuff. The Bible doesn't make it that complicated. The Bible says you want to defeat the devil? Give yourselves completely to God. Resist the devil, and he will run from you. Number three, you have authority over the devil. 
And I'm talking to every single one of us here today that's given your heart to Jesus Christ. You have authority over the devil. Luke 10, 17. The 72 returned with joy and said. Now, these guys were sent out by Jesus to evangelize, to, to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. And they came back all pumped up. And goes on to say, Lord, even the demons submitted to us in your name. We even have authority over the demons. The disciples are telling Jesus. And Jesus is saying, man, that is really not a big deal. Guys, let me give you a little history lesson here. And he goes on in verse 18. He replied, I saw Satan falling, fall like lightning from heaven. And Jesus is basically saying, he's not that bad. I kicked him out of heaven. I know you have authority over him because you're on my team. And I'm the winner of this battle. Verse 19, I have taken you, given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. I want everyone, one of us to say, all the power of the enemy. Oh, man, you guys got to say it like you believe it. All the power of the enemy. Guys, that's powerful when you think about it. That nothing will harm you. And you may say, well, what does that mean in the 21st century? What does that mean for life today? What does that mean for, for those of us here at Church of the Cross this, this Sunday morning? Well, let me tell you, it means that you do not have to live in the fear of the evil one. It means you don't have to be uh, consumed by the worries and the stresses of this life. It means you don't have to live a life of addiction. It means you don't have to live a life of bondage. It means you don't have to be controlled by the devil, that you don't have to continue down a, a life of self-destruction. It means you can live a life of freedom. It means you can live a blessed and abundant life, that you don't have to continue going down a negative road. And it's nothing that we do on our own, but it's because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished on Calvary. Verse 18, Satan fell like lightning from heaven. Jesus is saying, let me remind you that Satan has fallen. Satan has fallen into the lake of fire. Satan continues to fall when somebody gives their life to Jesus Christ, Satan falls. Every time that somebody does not give in to temptation, Satan falls. Every time you give yourself to God and you resist the devil, Satan falls. Every time that, that somebody sur surrenders to Jesus Christ, Satan falls. He is a defeated foe. You have authority and victory over the devil as a child of God. I don't want you ever to forget that.